everybody. Welcome to the show. It's the Board Game Mechanics. We're here again. In spite of all the odds, we keep making shows. Um, <laughs> number 92, I think. Wow. Yep, 92. It's kind of blowing my mind that we've done this as long as we have. And I'm going to tell you, Jason, that's 100% a, a credit to you. Like, I give up on stuff like this way too quick. And so you are my, you're my personal trainer of podcasts. And by the way, you can go ahead and introduce yourself, I guess. <laughs> hey, guys, what's going on? I am Joel's trainer, Jason. <laughs> Yeah, if you were my physical body trainer, you would lose your credentials. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be your podcast trainer. How about that? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, very cool. Well, we have a good episode ahead of us. Uh, zany banter, typically, but I think we want to just get right to it because, man, we've got a good show. We are talking about 22 games in total because we'll talk about a couple we played, then 10 each on our top 100s. Yep. So. These are the episodes we like recording. I think they're the episodes you guys like listening to. So we're going to get right at it. All right. So I can't contain myself with this first uh, piece of news. It's for a game that I really, really enjoy. And that is Abomination. And the news is that Plat Hat released a variant called the Igor variant, which is going to make the game shorter. And it's going to assist in mitigating the dice because that's the biggest complaint of most people is the game's too long and the dice rolling mitigation is awful. So this is going to start out some players with a couple pieces of the body on their table. They're going to start with some laden jars. They're going to start with some of the stats on each of the dials. And then the laden jars are also going to allow you to re-roll. So they're not just going to be to use to roll, but they're also going to allow you to re-roll. So that's hopefully going to help everybody feel a little better about some of that stuff. And the in-game points for the alive body parts have been reevaluated. Everything's with five, but the heads were 10. So if you thought it was a little too long, you maybe want to check that out. You can go on their website. I also shared it on our Facebook page, so you can find it there as well. So the Igor variant from Plaid Hat for Abomination, that's kind of cool. I'm not saying what I'm saying. Like, I'm right about this one. Because if you make a game and you're like, oh, crap, two weeks after this thing's released to retail, we've got to fix it with an emergency patch. There's a problem there. That's all I'm saying. Like, I don't own this game anymore. I don't like it. And like, I don't know. It's not just a terrible game. It's just, I have no reason to play this game. I just think about how my game playing time is finite. And I don't want to spend the time playing this game just because I didn't like it. I mean, like, it's nothing that's inherently wrong with it. And I know you like it. And that's cool, man. You do you. But like, I'm just not into it. And so I I just think that, uh, again, not saying but I'm saying. If you release a variant that fixes stuff by making it shorter and... Like, whatever. Like, you should have just done that from the beginning. And maybe if I played this with the Igor variant the first time, I wouldn't feel the way I feel about it. But I definitely did not like, did not like this game with the out-of-the-box rules. So, check it out with the Igor variant, I, variant, I guess, and and hope that it's better. Yeah, I was actually talking to somebody about this earlier. Uh, today, actually. And I wonder if that those two issues came up during playtesting or, on the flip side, I guess, did they playtest it enough? Because it seems like if that was an issue across the board people would have mentioned it in playtesting. So it's it's just interesting to me to see what would maybe happen back there. I was a Plaid Hat playtester at one time too. And I think that, I don't know about this game, but they got their playtesters just by like working through social media and different like re- like outlets of board game fans. And said, hey, do you guys want to playtest? If you do, here's our application. And I think almost everyone who applied got in. Hmm. So once you become a playtester for someone, you're so hyped to be a playtester, I think, that you just you view everything with rose colored glasses. Right. So Yeah, that's true. I, I think that's part of it too. I mean, if I were a playtester and I felt like I had a secret sneak peek on something, I'd be super into it too. So Yeah, that that's true. I know Stegmeyer, like he pays his playtesters. So I I mean like they and he wants honest feedback from them. So I don't know. I think it's probably not a huge issue, but it's definitely I mean, like I think I'd find out if the game was broken and stuff, but I wouldn't probably provide super constructive, unbiased feedback if I were able to be a part of a cool elite group, you know? Yeah. I don't know. That's kind of a thought. I guess that's true. Yeah. Uh, Oh, well. Um, The next game I wanted to talk about is currently on Kickstarter, and it's called Kohaku. It's $29, has 20 days to go, and this is an interesting little tile drafting game where you're trying to build a koi pond by drafting fish, flowers, frogs, turtles, and other things like butterflies and rocks. But the interesting thing here is you're drafting from this, like, I think it's a four by three grid, but it's a, it's an alternating pattern. So the grid is always koi, 
other thing, koi, other thing. And you have to draft adjacent tiles. So there may be two koi's out there or two other accessories that you want, but you always have to take a fish and you always have to take another thing. And everything that's not a fish is going to be like a point generator and all the fishes are going to be the way that you get points. So this is an interesting little tile placing game. It seems pretty light. Rado has a video and I heard about it a couple times from him. So go check that out if you want to know more. So that's Kohaku. Ah, very cool. Uh, I think there's like a board gaming show going on right now too, but meh, I don't know. It didn't happen in the USA, so I don't care. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. But this this next thing is not about the USA, really. Oh, well, I don't care. <laughs> you might care about this. Uh, European bird meeples from Meeple Source. Yeah, I completely care. Yeah, I was going to say, you're going to change your tune there. I saw it on the notes. I, I knew. I became a Stillmeyer champion just to make sure I could get the expansion uh, for for Christmas time for my beloved. And she's not going to listen to this, so it's not going to spoil any secrets. Uh, but uh, I, I really love this game, honestly. it's I mean, it's it's one that I think it feels – I finally won for the first time, and I won big. So that felt good. Um when I played this last week, but it's it's just a really good game. I, I really like it. And the European birds, kind of cool, man. Uh, the swan is a European bird, apparently, because that's one of the meeples. The swallows of Capistrano. African unladen swallows. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Uh, and if you're going to Essen this week, man, that's awesome. I'm happy for you if you're there right now or on your way back. I hope you had a great time. I'm just, you get all the jealousy. And honestly, if you're listening to Essen and our podcast, if you're going to Essen and listening to our podcast, I guess I should say, I want to know who you are because you're a very interesting person that you get board game information from us and go to Essen. Like, you're a very interesting person. <laughs> yeah, we're like the we're like the budget man's podcast. That's we're the I- trailer park boys of podcasts. Oh, <laughs> uh, you can call me Bubbles. Yeah, the parallels between us <laughs> being Bubbles and Ricky are so similar. Oh, uh, that's funny. Uh, any- anyway, that's all the news I have. So we can move on to other things, unless you have some pieces that you want to talk about. I wish I had a Rickyism ready to go right now to just, <laughs> he's got so many good things he says. So, uh, anyway, no, I don't, Jason. Um, but I know I was looking at Kickstarter and there were a couple of really killer ones on there. Um, I wish I'd have written them down, but I don't because I'm not the newsboy. <laughs> uh, no, there was a couple of really cool ones that I was like, oh, that looks kind of neat, but I, I don't remember what they are now. Oh, there's a new 18X game on there that I thought looked really cool. It's two 18X games in one box. Um, and I think they're reprints, but it's all both in one box. So it's like 1860 and 1873, uh, in the same box, which is kind of cool. I mean, not that the year number matters, cause like, I don't think anyone listening to this podcast is a real train aficionado who goes, huh, you fool. It's 1861. Everyone knows the Thomas <laughs> Ledwilly. I, that's, that sounded bad. The Thomas Ledwilly steam engine didn't come out till 61. This is clearly about the railroads going in and out of Austin, Texas. <laughs> You got to watch that Lead Willy one. <laughs> uh, I mean, that sounds dirty, but you know trains are called stuff like that. Yeah, they are. Johnny's uh, Iron Horse Stomper. I don't know. That's the 73 game. Uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I think we ought to go into what we played, huh? Okay, I'm going to get this started. Um, I played a game that... It's kind of old, I think. I don't know. I didn't look at the year. I didn't care. The game was 2004 fun. Spiel Winner, I think, or around 2004. Yeah, that sounds right. And that game... That's not right, because that's uh, Ticket to Ride, I think. I don't know. <laughs> it was around that era. That it, it, it was either a Spiel Winner or like, nominated, for sure, around that era. Yeah, we'll say this. It was released before this year's Essen. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So it's old. It's old. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that game is Zuloretto. And this did win the Spiel. I remember seeing that on the box, so yeah. Um, so what this, and it's Michael Schacht, I believe, is the designer. I think you're right, too. So what this game is, is you're trying to build this zoo, which fitting because it's called Zularetto. And you're doing that by pulling these tiles out of a bag and you're filling these trucks. Right. And on your turn, you're either going to pull a tile out of the bag and put it on the truck. You're going to spend some of your money to maybe move some of your animals from one pin to another or from your barn out or from in your park out to your barn. Or you're going to take one of those trucks, no matter how full it is, bring it over, put it in your park, and your turn's over for the round. 
So in that, the whole gist of this game really lies in that truck piece because you're trying to get tiles that you want, but you're not loading up a truck entirely the way you want it because someone's going to take it just to screw you over. So you may have to put it on these this truck that you don't necessarily want so you can at least get that one animal that you need. You can also buy stuff from your opponent's barn, which is kind of neat. So if they have an animal that they don't need and you need it, you can give them a coin, take it, and you're good to go. So this is a pretty light game. It's just a tile set collection game. But I enjoyed it a lot, and I haven't played it until last weekend, and it was enjoyable. So that is Zularetto. I haven't played this one in years, um, but I have played recently, and this is going to sound like a joke, but it's not. Zularetto Dice, uh, which is a thing. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> uh, I think it may have been... It was a German edition I played, um, but it wasn't language dependent or anything. But it's basically your zoo is a pad, and you checked off boxes of these animals, and you're trying to complete pens, and you rolled die and put them in the trucks. So it's kind of the similar idea. So I thought it was kind of neat, though. Like, actually, for a roll and write dice version of a big box game, it was pretty okay. That's cool. Um, yeah, no, Zularetto's cool, man. It's a good older game. Yeah, I I was blown away by it. It's 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 pretty light, but it was still enjoyable, yeah. and I had enough decisions to, you know, keep me in, interested. One hundred percent family weight. I mean, which to you is super light. I know. Yeah. But family weight is. I like family weight games because you can play them with a lot of people. Yeah, you know, I agree. You get a lot of table accessibility. I so. agree. I've actually been playing a lot more of those, which is fine as long as they're fun. I don't really care. Yeah, and I mean, you can play them drunk, which I, I know how that is. Now that you're a rock star. <laughs> yeah, I'm so <laughs> wasted right now. Fun fact, Jason is a rock star. If you're in the greater uh, Columbus, Ohio era, area uh, and you want to find uh, his band, uh, well, maybe do a Google search for his band. He's the only Jason Smith in a band. So uh, <laughs> go go find him. Watch him play his rock and roll guitar. You've got a mean looking SG, actually. It's a pretty good looking guitar. Yeah, it's nice. I like it a lot. Yeah, for sure. I've got an SG shaped bass, but I, I'm not as cool as you, bud. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all, all my friends in high school got the SGs because they wanted Gibsons, not Epiphones, and they could afford the SGs, not the Les Pauls. So that's why they ended up with the SG Gibsons. But I, I stuck with that tried and true Les Paul studio with that Epiphone headstock on it. <laughs> I have one of those too. My main guitar is an SG, a Gibson SG, and then my backup is an Epiphone Les Paul. Yeah. I, I really love my Godin. It's such a good guitar, but I've got a Fender Strat. So we're on opposite teams. We're, you're the single, I'm the single coil boy and you're the, the humbucker guy. Yep. So that's cool, man. We'll make some good music together. We'll be a regular James Eha, Billy Corgan thing going on there. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> All right. You've been listening to Pumpkin Talk with Joel and, Joel and Jason <laughs> getting back to board games. Uh, what do you get when you take the circumference of a pie? A pumpkin. And, oh, I ruined it. What do you get when you take the <laughs> circumference of a pumpkin and divide it by two? Pumpkin pie. <laughs> what? Oh, that might have to get edited out. Uh, which one of us is drunk again? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I played Donna Mankind, Jason. Oh, yeah. We are talking about games we played. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about this one. I played a bunch of games this last week had a great week of gaming um but i played dawn of mankind and it was really actually pretty good um i both of us did SM releases over the last week and i i think you were a little disappointed in yours but i think most people are hyped about the one you did and i don't think people know about this one but they will be hyped once they play it i think is kind of how it's gonna go this one's like kind of like a caveman game where you're making this this tribe of cave people uh go through some survival, some generations of survival. And you're basically going through this flow chart and every column of this flow chart represents a stage of life, whether it be childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and, and then being an elder. And as you go through the different stages of life, you can reproduce and produce more children, which puts more meeples onto your board. Or um, as you get older, you can produce art. But then every spot you stop in that stage of life, you have to choose what that person is going to do to contribute to your tribe, basically. So some people contribute by going hunting and they bring food and hides back to you. Um, others contribute by gathering. Others contribute by 
developing new ideas, which give you like slight little player powers that you get, like progress tokens. So um, it's a really, it's a race to 60 points. Whoever gets 60 points first says game's over and the game stops immediately when you get 60 points. Um, but then you may not win. You'll probably win, but you then calculate some in-game points. And it's certainly possible that even though you're the first person to 60, you won't win. Um, but basically it's a flow chart. You're working your people through these meeple things. And then you basically have to either get bumped out of your spot and then you can do another round of work with that worker or you have to take a rest action where you can convert food into victory points and everyone rests and they get ready for the next stage of life. So it's actually a pretty neat little game. Um, not bad. It's pretty light, uh, a pretty light little worker placement game, but kind of done slightly different, like kind of worker movement, like flow track, flow, flow chart kind of things. Um, so I, I think it's pretty neat. I think people are going to see it at Essen and think, oh, that's a cool little game. So uh, Dawn of Mankind, which is very similar to another game that's coming out right now, um, Dawn of Humanity, but <laughs> yeah. that's called Tribes, I think, right? Yeah, so, Tribes. So anyway, I like this game quite a bit. Um, it was pretty good. Um, and Jason, why don't you go ahead and do a bonus, what you played? Go ahead. What's your Essen release that you thought was meh? Uh, it was called Aristocracy from TMG. Yeah. And it's a new Reiner Knizia game. Like, my buddy that I played it with actually really enjoyed it. He loved it. He want, he thought it was one of the better, like, family weight games that he's played in a while. I just don't like that Reiner Knizia mechanism of flipping over things and then trying to build lines on the board. And that's kind of what this game is. You flip tiles and then you're trying to build buildings and lines to have better lines than your opponents. Yeah. I don't love that, but a lot of people do like it, which is why it's super pumped up at Essen. I, it's just not for me. It Like his games, you either love them or you don't. And I don't either um, because they all feel like math problems kind of, you know, and it makes sense. He's got a doctorate in math, I think. Right. So um, I, I don't know. It looks pretty whimsical for his games though, because TMG put it out. So, and it actually, I think it is TMG putting it out. Like usually right. Kinesia games are put out by like, Glofkenhaven or whatever German company. <laughs> yeah. And then the American companies buy it from them. But I think this is actually developed by TMG. So it's got kind of cool art and stuff for a Kinesia game. It really does. Like the production is the best part of it. Everything is amazing in it. Like the little pieces are cool. Everything's awesome. And it is an okay game. It's just not for me. Yeah. I think you could objectively say it's a good game, but it's not one that you care for. Right. Correct. Yeah. That's cool, man. All right. Well, hey, guess what? It's time. We're going to get right into it. <laughs> All right, so we're back with our Top 100 Games of All Time, Part 2. This is 10% better than what we did last week, and we're going to be talking about numbers 90 through 81. There may be some crossover. There may not. You might get 20 games. You might get 10 games. We'll see when we get started. So I'm going to start with my number 90, and my number 90 is a little tiny card game from Eagle Griffin, and it is called For Sale. And what For Sale is, is it's an auction game really that's it it's an auction game and what you're doing is it's played over two rounds the first round you're trying to auction to get these houses or buildings i guess it's going to be from like a cardboard box up to like a space station and they have different values from like zero to i think 32 or something like that and after everybody's done that everybody has a hand of buildings then you're going to auction off the buildings for money cards so you're going to flip some money cards Everyone's going to pick one of their buildings that they would like. The highest building is going to get first dibs at picking the money cards. The goal of the game is to have the most money. So whoever has the most money at the end of the game is the winner. That's for sale. I like it because you can play with anybody. Everybody has a good time. And if they hate it, it's 10 minutes. We can move on to something else. So my number 90 for sale. Jason, that's a good one. And I, I don't think it made my top 100. If it did, cool. But I don't remember being on there. Um, and it's not because it's not a good game. I love this game. It's when I think of filler games, this is the one that automatically pops in my head because it's the perfect filler game. Um, anybody can play it. It's super quick. What a good game. Good pick, Jason. Very good pick. Thanks. I like it. My number 90, brand new number 90. It just got promoted. <laughs> like literally just got promoted because uh. of inside jokes. Um, my number 90 is The Reckoners. Uh, this is from Navu Games, I think is the name. Yes, that um, sounds right. And it's a cool game. It's a co-op game where you all have your own special powers. You're rolling these die to try and kind of do the whole, like, get the faces you want to do the actions you want to do. And you're using these die faces to try and fight these baddies. And it's basically uh, you're all average citizens with some kind of skills that are natural that you would learn in the natural realm of skill learning. 
and you're fighting against a superhero and this superhero is evil and I forget his name, but it's, it's like iron face or something. I don't know. Steelheart. Um, there you go. How did you know that Jason? I know about this game. I've just never played it. <laughs> Steelheart. Um, I own it and I don't know the guy's name. <laughs> and actually I started reading the book and I don't know this guy's name. So <laughs> I lived really hard in my like late teens and early twenties. <laughs> So (laughs) I'm right there with you, but evidently my mind's a little, my memory's a little bit better than yours. Well, you're younger than me too. So that helps. Uh, That's true. That's true. I'm 70 years old, Jason. (laughs) You don't sound a day over 69. (laughs) 70. I just turned the big seven zero. Uh. (laughs) Did you guys, do you guys, do you hear that, Jason? That's. People swiping into their into their Facebook app to look at my picture and be like, "Is he seventy? <laughs> You're young, seventy. You're young. Yeah, I look good for seventy. Uh, for I do look good for seventy. I don't look good for thirty nine, which is how old I really am. Um, uh. Yeah, so Jason's a young buck. He remembers stuff. But yeah, Steelheart is the bad guy that you're fighting. Uh, but it's kind of cool. There's different locations and little like kind of cronies that come out that you have to fight. So it's all about balancing. You have to basically get clues about how to defeat Steelheart by defeating his cronies. And then if you get enough clues to do that, then you can go fight him. It's a really cool little co-op game. Um, I want to play it again, like pretty soon. It's, it's, I, every time I play it while I'm playing it, it's good. It's good enough that I went out and bought a, really expensive copy after I played it. And then I've played it once since then. And I remember having fun playing it, but it's one of those games that when you're not playing it, it doesn't seem that good. So it's hard for me to talk about it, but I know that the next time I play it, I'll really enjoy it. So um, the Reckoners, it's a really cool game. In spite of what I say about it, that's not very enthusiastic. <laughs> this one actually seems like one I want to play. Cause last time I looked at some stuff on it, it looks just like a bunch of tracks and I do love tracks. <laughs> it That's what it is. Yeah. I may it's, have to play this. It's basically Newton, the cooperative superhero game. <laughs> I'm in. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's actually just a little better to set up, too, because all you have to do is put out, like, 50 plastic trays and cards <laughs> on top of them, as opposed to Newton. We have to put 100 different tiles on different places. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's funny. All right, yeah. Maybe I'll play this one someday. That's cool. Cool. All right. So my number 89 is a game that I played for the first time this year at Origins with one of the members of the Riveted. And my wife. I can't believe this made your top 100. Dude, I like it. I don't know why. Every time I play it, it gets better and better. I, I, I don't know. I like it. I kind of like the... It's yacht- so not your kind of game. I know it's not. But I do like the Yahtzee style stuff. And that's why this one I enjoy. So this is... Farkle. I just spoiled it. Farkle. He loves Farkle. <laughs> yeah, it's Farkle. <laughs> uh, it's just Yahtzee. It's Ancient Terrible Things is my 89. And what this is, it's, a, it's essentially Yahtzee with the Cthulhu theme plastered on it. So... You're trying to roll dice to get certain combinations of numbers to defeat these monsters for points. Each of the monsters have like a different suit kind of. So it'll be a different type of monster that they are. I can't remember the symbols, but there are four different symbols. And if you can get certain numbers of each of those types of monsters, you can get some in-game goals that are going to give you some more points. So if you like Yahtzee and you like Cthulhu, I would say go check out Ancient Terrible Things. If you can find it, that'll be the caveat. And that's my number 89 Ancient terrible things. So this is fun to me because if I had to ask you, like, what's your definition of a mediocre game? You'd be like Elder Sign. Elder Sign's a very mediocre game. It's fine. And you just described Elder Sign. <laughs> no, I don't. There's something about Elder Sign. I, I feel like Elder Sign has too many rules for what it is. It, it is fiddly. So this one is just super easy. Like you roll some dice. Did you defeat the monster? No. Okay. The monster hits you. You become a little bit insane. Next player's turn. Moving on. So it, it's quick and it doesn't take five hours like Elder Sign. So it's the game Elder Sign should have been. Like if, Correct. if this game would have been more thematic, I think that we'd have a real winner that I'd really like. Because the thing I don't like about Elder Sign, until I talk about it in my top 100 and really love it, <laughs> um, is uh, the thing I don't like about it is that really it is. It feels like a game that like Corey... The guy from FFG. I don't know how to say his last name. Corey K. And... Yeah, Corey K and the whole crew were sitting around making a game one day, and they basically were playing Ancient Terrible Things before it was Ancient Terrible Things. Like, this is super cool. Okay, yeah, but what if you could open portals? And then, oh, yeah, and we could spawn monsters on top of stuff. And then also add more die. I don't know. Like, it feels like everything's tacked on in an Elder Sign a little bit. Yeah, I agree. For sure. So Ancient Terrible Things I need to play, it sounds like, because it sounds actually really cool. It's light, but... I mean, it's it's Yahtzee. I'm so. cool with you. I'm cool yeah. with light, bud. I'm cool with that. Yeah, it's it's fun. I enjoy it a lot. All right. Speaking of light games that are pretty fun, number 89 for me 
Is antiquity? Just, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, that's super. That's super uh, light. <laughs> it's Century Spice Road, uh, a which good one. is a, a perfectly good game. It's a, about as basic an engine builder as you can get, um, where you're either taking a card to get better stuff or using your stuff to get points. So uh, I've learned the what they call Jason Smith strategy in this game which is where you take as few cards as possible is kind of how I play the game. Because every time you take a card, yep. you're, you're kind of wasting a turn not getting cubes. So unless there's a really astonishing card out there or a ton of cubes on the cards out there, I don't take cards anymore, hardly at all. And I found it works pretty good. So there's your pro strat. But um, And I'm sure we're going to have comments about how you fool. Everyone knows Reiner Kinesia's strategy <laughs> of taking a card every third turn works. Um, I don't know. <laughs> So, I don't know. Century Spice Road is a game that I do like, though, quite a bit. Um, it's just simple, and it's just well put together, and it's something you can teach to about anybody, and it's a good game. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is on my list somewhere. It might not be in my top 100, but I know this is my favorite of the trilogy is Century Spice Road. Really? Yeah. Because I, I thought you liked the third game a little more. I did, too, but the more I think about it, I think Century Spice Road is just cleaner. It does the same. Yeah. It does the same thing. It's less fiddly. It's just play a card, take a card, complete a contract, done, move, let's go. Like I don't know. It's just I love it. It's so fun. Well, my thing on it is is I I guess I could say this about the Tempest series too. If if Century Spice Road doesn't come out, I don't think that those other two games come out with that theme at least. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was an impactful enough game that they were like, let's form these other games around this like universe or whatever. Same thing with the Tempest series. If Love Letter doesn't come out, those other Tempest games don't come out. And there's there's a couple of good games in that Love Letter like Tempest series. Right. So, I mean, I don't know. That was man, the ADD is really strong tonight. But hey, guess what? You got a long flight to Germany, so <laughs> our long episode's going to treat you right. Yep. All right. So moving on to my number eighty eight is a game from Stonemeyer and it is called Scythe. What? Yeah. That's awesome because I thought this was in your bottom 88 of all things that you hate in life. No, I like this game. It's just not it's not my favorite Stonemeyer game. Yeah, no, I, I'm super psyched it's on your top 100 and the fact that this one's at 88 tells me something else is going to be much higher, which is awesome. Yeah. So everybody knows what Scythe is. It's a euro game that has arbitrary minis that really don't do anything. It has the threat of war. You may have some war. You may not. But really what you're trying to do is you're trying to race to get so many stars on the board. I think it's five. I'm not sure. It probably varies on player count. But you're trying to complete some objectives, gather resources, maybe win a fight, maybe lose a fight. You're trying to do a whole bunch, do a whole bunch of things to get some stars on the board. And you're going to do that in probably one of the most Euro ways possible by action selecting on a little player board. Super fun. Um, I've only played it actually twice, I think. So I'd like to play it some more maybe and try some of the stuff that's from the Fenrir thing. Cause, <laughs> yeah. Because you don't even have to fight in that one, and I want to play that little yeah. track. So my number 88, even with the war, is Scythe. Yeah, Rise of the Fenris. Um, I, I haven't played the campaign on that, and I don't want to play the campaign. I want to just tear all the modules apart and play with them, and I think I probably can do that. But I haven't broken into that because I I don't know. I don't have I don't have an awesome group for campaigning right now. Like I just finished a campaign game with my son, and for me to ask him to do that, like he would probably die, like die, <laughs> like literal, like <laughs> teenage boy tears would come out of his face if I asked him to play another campaign game. So I'm not going to do that to him. But I love this game, and if you want to hear more about it, um, for me, probably listen in a couple weeks or so, um, maybe more. So it's coming up for me. Uh, just. So, you know, uh, number 88 for me, though, Jason, is uh, a really cool deduction kind of lying game called Secret German Tyrant. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's censored for S and Week. <laughs> yeah. S uh, Secret Hitler. My favorite thing about this game is that I played it with a bunch of like, um, like middle school kids that are basically super sheltered from like our Sunday school class kind of thing. Right. And they all loved it so much. They put it on their Christmas list for their grandparents <laughs> who are ultra conservative, like Mennonites. <laughs> so that made me really laugh and have a good time. So <laughs> that's hilarious. And then, uh, and then I had that, I had those same kids in my house and I was like, all right, I'm going to play Hail Hydra with them because like, I'm hoping they'll like this game as well. And then maybe they'll ask for Hail Hydra instead of Secret Hitler. And they sure didn't. They liked Secret <laughs> Hitler better. Like, all right, this is cool. Let's go play Secret Hitler. Um, <laughs> as they should. It's a fun game. You're basically, it's not 
Hitler when he was the Hitler. It was Hitler when he was becoming a powerful official in Germany. Right, right, right. And it kind of copies, I mean, a little bit his rise to being chancellor. So that he was deceptive and seemed like he wasn't a lizard person, like he really is. And in the game, he really is a lizard person. So that's yep. kind of fun. So um, Secret Hitler is a cool game, though. You're passing policies, basically. And it's got this cool thing of sometimes all the negative policies come to you, and you're a good guy, and you want to be a good liberal and pass the good policy, but you can't because you were only handed negative things. And sometimes you were handed a positive and a negative thing, and you're not one of the good good liberal boys. You're a fascist. And you say, I was only given two red things. And they go, no, you weren't. What? You gave me two red. Why are you trying to make me seem like I'm a fascist? Because you're a fascist, but you're really the fascist. And arguments ensue. And eventually you start calling everyone Hitler. And people cry and laugh and friendships are tested. And <laughs> that's why this game's number 88. Yeah. I don't even know where it is on my list. I'm trying to find it. It's not on my 100, I don't think. But I do really like this game. It's it's one of the party games that I don't mind busting out and playing because it's just crazy. It is. It's very crazy. All right, so moving on from Hitler, we're going to talk about a game where we're going to be building train tracks. So my number 87 is a game called Snowdonia. And, yeah. And this is a worker placement game where you're trying to build this track. I don't know where it takes place. Snowdonia, maybe. But they, each of the tracks have different names. But it's a historical train track area. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to build these tracks by clearing off rubble. You're trying to build train stations. You're trying to um, get in-game goal cards. So when you turn dig it rubble or build train stations, you can maybe turn that in for some points. So it's worker placement, but with a little bit of, I don't know, like you're kind of working together to build these train tracks because someone might have to clear off the rubble for you to go in there and then build something else. So you're kind of doing a little bit of cooperativeness, but you're playing competitively. So I kind of dig that. So my number 87, Snowdonia. By Tony Boydell. Yes, correct. Are you impressed I knew that? I am impressed, even though that's like his one big game. Didn't he do like Guilds of London too? Yeah, I just happen to have that one sitting next to me on my <laughs> desk here. So, yeah. Tony Boydell, uh, maker of the most train game and mean game ever. So, <laughs> yep. Uh, cool. Uh, my number 87, Jason, is a game that you're going to probably, I don't know, you might grow in that it's number 87 to me, but this is, I think, maybe my first game from 2019 on the list. Uh, and that is Parks. By Keymaster Games. I, I like it. It's a good game. Great game. Uh, it's the 87 on it is me trying the best I can to be objective. Like if I just went by how giddy I get when I play this game, it'd be like top 20 because <laughs> the components are so good. That's true. Um, it's got amazing components in it. So Parks is really fun. It's basically a worker movement kind of game where you're doing set collection to try and visit Parks and have a memorable experience. Is probably what thematically is happening, but you're really just trying to match up these symbols in order to get these park cards for points by getting certain symbols. What was that watch? My watch just talked to me. I don't know if you heard that. No, I um, didn't hear it. I think my watch likes parks too. Um, so that's parks. It's a really rock solid game. And I think some other things worth mentioning in there, you can get these canteens that can turn water into other resources or actions at times. You can get equipment that kind of it's so it's a good introduction to like kind of like tableau building or power power building uh, and customization of your abilities. But then it's just kind of this cool walk along a path um, to Kaido, but better, in my opinion. So uh, Parks. I agree. I'll talk about this more. Maybe later. So we'll just leave it at that for now. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> so my number 86 is a game that Tom Vassell really enjoys, and it's called Vasco da Gama. Ooh. Yeah, so I think this might have been higher last year. I can't remember, but I haven't gotten to play it. I don't think I played it at all this year, but I still want to. I just can't ever find anybody that wants to play it, so that's kind of a struggle. But this is a game where you're sailing the Mediterranean, trying to go to ports and do some stuff and get some things. And you're doing that through this interesting action selection where you're going to pick a tile off this grid of numbers. I think it's one through like 30 something. I don't know, but it's basically the higher the number is the later you're going to go to resolve your worker. So you may place your worker first, but you may take the highest number on the board. So you're going to resolve your, your worker last. The trick here is there's also this little economy guy that if you go too early before this guy, it's going to cost you a whole pile of money to trigger your action. So you're trying to balance, 
Do you want to go late? That way you're not spending any money. Do you want to risk it to see how much the economy is going to change? And maybe you can get it, get your action a little bit before everybody else. And that give and take and push and pull is kind of interesting to me. So I dig it. So my number 86, Vasco da Gama. Yeah. To, to, uh, to kind of put this game in context, it's, uh, it's the worst looking what's your game game, which is not easy to do. <laughs> That's true. It doesn't look good at all. I'll give you that. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think this one, I don't know. It's trading on the Mediterranean. and But your guys have numbers. That's cool. Um, I don't really remember this game very much, to be honest. So I should probably play it again. My, t- my taste in games has changed enough that I'd probably actually like it now. Um, but yeah, uh, cool. Number 86, Jason, for me, is none other than a game that I'm going to get crap for because no one likes it but me. The DC Comics deck building game uh, by Cryptozoic. And I'm really kind of looking at all these Cryptozoic games that are deck builders because they're the same game, just with different themes. Like, I'm positive you could shuffle the NHL hockey game in with the deck building game from DC Comics, and it would work fine. You'd have Patrick Kane taking out the Joker, and it would have worked out just fine. That'd be awesome. I mean, to be honest. <laughs> it kind of would. Uh it's. I'm just kind of amalgamating all those games into one. I actually probably like DC, the, the NHL power play deck building game um, as well or better because it's got kind of an extra mechanism in it where you're playing defense against people. Um, but this one's basically you're just building a deck. So your your cards either have attack power or money value. And you're playing them down, your whole hand of cards, and you're buying what you can and attacking what you can. And then when you take things out, when you take bad guys out, they become part of your deck, which is kind of weird but they give you little benefits or powers. And so it doesn't feel thematically. I think the reason why people don't like this game is because it doesn't work thematically. It's like, it just doesn't make sense at all. And it's like, even legendary makes sense. It's like, I'm Nick Fury and I'm leading this team of superheroes. But I'm going to tell you right now, DC Comics tech building game doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> I'm going to play down a Clayface and a Batman and a Joker and a Robin, and they all go out together and fight crime. I, it doesn't make any sense at all, but um, it's a fun game. And so DC deck, DC Comics deck building game, you can get it out, play the game, put it away inside of an hour, which is kind of awesome too. Um, and it's pretty compact. I actually have mine in two of those little photo boxes from Michael's so I can take it with me anywhere. So, uh, that's my number 86 DC comics deck building game. I don't expect to get any love on that one and that's okay. It's my own personal little like game. I like, yeah, I've never played it. Is this like an Ascension or a dominion type game closer to Ascension, but like even more streamlined and like quick to play than that. Cause really there's only like a row of five cards out. Mm -hmm. There's not stacks of cards. It's just like five cards that you can buy from and some of them are like equipment cards so you play as batman with superman's cape too which is kind of weird i think that i think that's cool kind of so i mean it's just a super light deck building game and then you also have bad guys pop up in there and then there's another pile of like super villains not just villains Mm -hmm. so it's more like ascension than it is dominion but it's not really like either and both those game designers would probably be really really hurt that their game got compared to this one (laughs) but I, i like it i like it better than either of those to be honest so it's it's my own little little guilty pleasure or whatever pick. And I know that at least one of our listeners uh, does like this game too and likes the whole Cryptozoic deck building game stuff. So I've got one friend, but other than that, I don't expect anyone else to understand and that's okay. I'll be a little emo kid with my hair plastered to my head and listening to um, all the Taking Back Sunday. (laughs) And Dashboard Professional. Yeah, Uh, yeah, I can't give you any crap because I've never played it, but I like deck builders, so I'm sure it's fine. I just want to do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on from lawsuits, we are going to my number eighty-five, and it is I, that was a, that was a pitch perfect copy. So we are going to get a copyright strike. <laughs> <laughs> so my number eighty-five is a Dice Tower Essential game, and it's called Royals. Yeah, uh, this is essentially. I'm not going to tell you a lot about it, but it's essentially Ticket to Ride with area control. So you're collecting cards that are certain colors and you're using those cards to put cubes down on certain territories to try to control that territory to score point tiles. Whoever has the most point tiles at the end of the game wins the game. And there's two different scoring periods where you're going to get points based on who has the most in each territory. So along with the tiles you're earning, you're also going to do a couple scoring rounds. It's super quick. Uh, it gets a little mean once everybody has some territories because you can boot people out and and steal their territory, but it's so quick that it doesn't bother me. So my number 85, Royals. 
Yeah, it's a good game. It didn't make my top 100, but it's in my top 200. And it's one that nobody plays um, because it looks like it's from 1998, I think, honestly, is why. I mean, the box is kind of not that awesome looking. It looks kind of like your standard stuffy Euro game. Um, and it's not. It's a family weight, area control kind of cool game. So I think people should play this one in spite of the box kind of thing. Um, and the other thing, too. Hey, Jason, let's say you and I tied for Kings. What happens at the end of the game? You remember? You break that tile in half and we both share the points. Yeah, you do. There's those cool puzzle piece tiles. I love that. Yeah, so it's awesome. More games should do that. So cool. Good pick, Jason. Hey, Jason, I'm a brave podcaster <laughs> and I'm going to get some delicious snacks delivered on my broom. Um, broom service, man, number 85. Basically, it's an action selection game where you're trying to pick actions that other people aren't taking so you can be brave instead of cowardly and get extra benefits. But if you think you pick something someone else picked, you can always be cowardly, and then you all can go do that thing. You're basically building potions and delivering them around on this board. A really light little game. A kind of remake of a game called Witch's Brew um, that was out of print for a long time, so people were super happy to get this. It was pretty hot for a minute, won, won some awards for a minute, and then people stopped playing it and never played it again. And I think it's honestly a game that you can probably get pretty cheap because it's like in that whole like family of games on Amazon that are like 23 bucks. So um, room service, cool game. Don't have a whole lot to say about it, but I do like it. And I think you and I are two of the only people who still do. Oh yeah. I like this game a lot. I just, it's another one of those games that nobody in my game group wants to play for some reason. <laughs> I don't get it. And I'll probably be talking about this one later too. It's cause they're cowardly witches, Jason. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. They don't have, they're not brave enough to play this game. That's true. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> All right, so my number 84 is a game about running a library and putting books in order, and it is called Ex Libris. So this is a worker placement game, sort of. You do a little bit of worker placement, but the core of the game is tableau building. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to do worker placement to get cards in your hand, which are going to be a type of book, and they're going to have letters and numbers. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get a bookshelf – created in alphabetical alphabetical and numerical order along with the type of books that you have a secret goal for all the while avoiding the forbidden books that give you minus points so it, it seems like it's not a fun game but building that tableau and trying to put those books in order is tricky and i enjoy it it's more fun than it probably should be but i don't know i like this for some reason so my number 84 ex libris Jason, I want to play this one more, but I got this one to play with my wife, and she grew up in the satanic hysteria of the 80s, and so did I. And now in the 2010s, I'm able to go, ha, 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 very good joke, Molly Crew, with your pentagrams. I don't care. <laughs> and so pentagrams don't matter to me. My wife won't hold cards with pentagrams on them. Like, she literally won't. She thinks they're inherently evil. So <laughs> I'm laughing at her, but I mean, like, whatever. So she doesn't like that. Like, honestly, she's like... Ooh, that feels evil. And she doesn't like even the elder sign. So I mean, like, <laughs> so there's definitely pentagrams all over this game. Cause like one of the categories of books is like Mon magic yeah, or something. It's monsters, I think. No, no, there's yeah. something that's a pentagram. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, I mean, like, that's just, it's kind of my funny aside, but a good game. It's a little like set collection y kind of game. Yeah. yeah it's, it's another light game too, but I really enjoy it. Yeah. It's good. It's renegade. Got good production value too. Yep. Uh, this next game doesn't have, well, no, it does have good production. Uh, Eh, it's okay. Um, the art isn't awesome on it, but the plastic bits are amazing. And it's Clash of Cultures. It's a civilization builder. I was going to tease this one as I've got a civilization builder with cool plastic pieces in it on my list. And I do, but that's coming up later. Um, this one's 84, though, and it's Clash of Cultures. And basically, you build different parts of a city um, around your central part of your city. So the plastic pieces, they don't snap together, but they all slide together and make like actually a, like, a larger city on the map, which is really cool. Um, but you're building different parts of a city, developing tech trees to like make your civilization bigger. And it's actually a genuine, true civ building game where you're going to have combat and you're going to have exploration on a map. And... I know there's another game that is getting beat up for not being a true civ game, and it's not, but this one really is. So this is my favorite true civilization building game because it's pretty light, it's pretty straightforward, and it plays fairly quickly. It's a 4X game that plays in two and a half hours. So uh, Clash of Cultures has really cool player boards too with the recessed, like you move your 
squares, like your plastic cubes down the recessed track. So that's always a nice touch too. Um, but this one, if you, th- if this sounds even remotely cool to you, if you've seen it and you've thought about getting it, I've been warning people forever about this and I think it will actually happen at some point. I know that the designer of this game said that he took the game back from Z-Man and Z-Man kept all their assets. And so it won't get reprinted. So, um, or at least it won't likely get reprinted because the designer's gone into other things. And, um, I don't know. I don't know that it'll ever be scarce, but I know that they're not printing it anymore. So with Z-Man, who knows? They may have five warehouses full of this game left yet. So, um, it's possible that it could become kind of rare at some point. So, uh, Clash of Cultures. I actually heard from Joel Eddy that a new edition was in the making. Huh. I, Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. He mentioned it on one of his like drive through podcast things. That's possible, I guess, but I know it won't be Z Man because like Z Man and the designer had a pretty big breakup. Right. So, yeah. And I forget who it's, uh, I forget who the designer is. I'm not even going to guess. I was going to say like Paulo Mori or whatever his name is, but it's definitely yeah, not, it's him. not him. <laughs> um, it's some dude. So, from Scandinavia, I'm pretty sure. Well, that's cool. So, just be on the lookout. It may or may not come into print, like you said. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, the last I heard from the designer was he was like, I definitely don't have any of the art or graphic design. I own the mechanics in the, like, text. But, yeah, like, the way his contract was. So, I mean, I it absolutely could get another edition where someone else did the art and design. So, I guess really the other thing, too, is if somebody was like, hey, we want to reprint your game, he could say, yeah, go ahead. And he wouldn't have to do anything. So, that's true. it's certainly possible. Do you still have this one? Yeah, I do. Is this one you think I would play or and, and like? Nah, you'd hate it. Okay, yeah, I figured as much. I just wasn't it's, sure. It's it's mean fighting dice rolling Ugh. kind of yeah, stuff. I'm out. Yeah, I mean, like the dice rolling's better in it than most games, but it's still like go roll dice and fight each other. Gotcha. Yeah, that's what I figured. All right, cool. Well, it's it like the way how the dice combat works in it is like every six that you get is in a, is a hit. So if I roll four dice or whatever, and I roll a five, a two, a six, and a three, I'd get like, you know, two sixes out of that because you add the dice together. Like, so the sum of my dice divided by six is how many hits I get. So that's kind of a cool system, I think. I'm, I think I'm remembering that right. So it's, it's kind of a cool way to do that, but cause it like kind of mitigates bad rolls a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. That's cool. So I'm going to go to my number 83, which uses dice in the way that I enjoy, and that is rolling them, sitting them on your board, and then using them as workers. I really enjoy that. And this game is the Artemis Project. So this is a dice placement game where you're going out to this board to collect different types of resources. You're using your dice to bid on certain kinds of buildings so that you can get them on down by your player board, and then you're trying to fill them up with certain types of explorers to this planet i think it's a planet i always think it's antarctica but i think it's a planet and you're trying to get certain colored explorers on certain cards for like a set collection in-game scoring bonus so this is a normal worker placement dice game but the way that you're bidding with the dice on some of the buildings gives it a little bit of a twist and i enjoy that so my number 83 is the artemis project yeah it looks really good honestly i've not played this one but i think it looks pretty awesome my number 83, Jason, is a game that um, I'm positive you're going to talk about later, so I won't say too much about it, um, and we're kind of running along here, but I'll just do the Jason Smith treatment of this game. This game's a game where you're getting building materials, it's a rondelle, and it moves, and you can either get things right away, or you can wait a while and hope to get more things. <laughs> That's true. That's Zulkin, the Mayan Empire. That's the perfect Or the Mayan Mayan calendar. <laughs> That's all it is. It's very simple. You're getting building materials to build your stuff. Get them now or hope to get them later and get more. That's it. So, <laughs> and the rondelle moves. <laughs> Speaking of that description, somebody actually zinged me on the riveted about the way that I described games. He said it was about root. He said, Jason Smith's description of the bird story would be this. Play a card to your tableau, do the axes in your tableau, then draw a card. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Hey, what's wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing. All yeah. right. Yeah, I sound like a drunk Harry Carey when I describe games, so I don't know. I think we're a, a good medium between us would be great. <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to talk too much about that because it, it, it's probably going to show up later. Yeah. So my number 82 is a cooperative game and a deck building game and a game about Harry Potter, and it's called Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Um, I, think, yeah. I think the reason this is so high is because I've played it so much. Like, I've played it with Katie a ton. 
we took it to some friend's house in Fort Wayne and played it with, well, it's Katie's college roommate. We played it with her. She doesn't play a ton of games and she enjoyed it. So what this is, is you're working together as one of the students from Harry Potter's universe. So Harry, Ron, Hermione, Luna, um, Neville. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to use spells and different type of items to defeat the big bads from the book. So you have like Bellatrix, um, Fenrir, Greyback, and all the good, you know, baddies. So if you can kill all them, then you got to fight Voldemort. If you can beat Voldemort, you win the game. The trick here is you're supposed to play it one book at a time. So year one through year seven. But what I like to do, like any good gamer should do, is just take it all, mix it together, and go to town. So when you do that, the game's going to slap you around and it's going to be really hard. <laughs> so if you like hard deck builders that are really tricky to win, then maybe check this one out. So that's Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Yeah, I uh, I have this one. I bought this one actually used from a listener and friend, and I haven't played it yet. So I can't really say much about it. But when I bought it, I was thinking it was kind of in that Cryptozoic family. And then I was like, no, wait, this is USAopoly. It's like totally different. So, and it is a USAopoly game, I think, which yeah. is kind of funny. It's, it's a legit good deck builder, though. Like, even if you take out the cooperative part and the fighting people, just the... The deck building part is kind of interesting. So, yeah, I like it. Well, I'm curious about it because all the cards I have are like not, he didn't use the tuck boxes. He's like, the tuck boxes get really annoying. Yeah. So I just got rid of yeah, them. Yeah, that's what I did. And, and so, and I think pretty well everyone says that too. So I've got to kind of sort things out and figure out how to play it, but I don't think it'll be too hard. But I really do want to play this one. And I got this one to be like a Sunday afternoon play with my family kind of game. And so I'm hoping this one will get played over the next year. Um, if I played it once and then didn't play the whole campaign, like immediately would I be in trouble or is it something I can play like gradually? If you start at year one and you don't, if, if you don't get to year four, year four unlocks a whole, like, like three, four new mechanisms in the game. And like, it adds some dice and it adds a whole bunch of other stuff. So I would at least try to play through year four. Cool. All right, Jason, it's time for my number 82, a one and a two <laughs> and a talk. <laughs> About number 82. That, All right, Jason. Uh, that's actually pretty good. <laughs> uh, Jason, my number 82 is CO2 Second Chance. Uh, <laughs> this is a game where I had self-esteem and then Vida was like, no, you don't. You can't do this. You're not good at it. You've won, supposedly, you cheater. Um, this is a game that's really hard. It's a cooperative game. The way I have it is fully cooperative. I think yours is semi-co-op. Right. Um, I play it the full co-op game, um, where you're trying to keep the parts per million of carbon down out of the atmosphere, but people just want their electricity. So, um, if you don't provide them with enough clean energy, they're going to start building those nasty soot producing power plants. And you're going to be sad because the, the parts per million is going to go up every round a lot faster. So it's balancing a bunch of different stuff. Um, trying to figure out how to present at summits to try and get extra actions. It's like a standard Vidal Lacerda game in a lot of ways. Like there's a main thing, but then that always triggers other things to happen because there's executive actions and main actions is basically what happens in this one mechanically as well. But it's kind of got this cool staging thing where you're basically doing a land grant and then you're building like the the infrastructure for the power plant and then the power plant on top of it, which is kind of cool. So, and you can like use other people's kind of work that they've been working on to complete it. Um, but there's just benefits for every part of it that you do. It's pretty cool. And uh, I don't know. It's, I, I really like it. Um, you have to work with carbon, to, carbon credits uh, as a way to kind of balance how much payment you're going to get, but also as a way to, you know, like invest different ways into different kinds of energy. Um, just kind of a neat game. For how you just have to, it's a, it's a really, it's like, if the, if I could explain the way how this game makes you feel, it makes you feel like there's not a lot of hope for humanity is one thing. But I think the other thing it makes you feel is it makes you feel like you have this huge, that old game topple. Like you have that old game topple where you like, if you put too many things on one side, the, the whole table flops over and you lose all the plastic pieces. Like this game feels like that. It feels like if you do too much of one thing, you're really going to be hosed because you didn't do enough of another thing. So you have to keep things in balance so well. And it's actually a pretty cool game for that. I agree. I haven't played the fully co-op. I just have the original before it got reprinted. But the thing that I think is interesting, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is even though the one I have is semi-co-op, you're still basically playing a co-op game you're just trying to maybe 
play it a little bit better than everybody else. <laughs> yeah, if you don't play it primarily as a co-op, even in semi-co-op, you're not going yeah, to win. Lose. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's it's interesting. Yeah, it really is. I think it's more of a political statement game too. Like, hey, we've got to put our differences aside and try and do the right thing, you know. And actually, I'm going to be honest. Like, I Vidal, if you hear this, honest to goodness truth. Like, I'll have an aluminum can in my hand, and I'll be like, throw this in the trash, and I'm like, no, I'll make the I'll make the extra five steps and go put this in the recycling bin. Like, it makes me think about that, and like turning off lights when I leave rooms and stuff like that, because it makes me understand just how complex and heavy the whole like energy thing is and that we all need to be better stewards so this is kind of games as art too oh yeah i agree this could totally be a game that you could do use in a science class or something and it would probably paint the picture better than a textbook would for sure i don't think and vidal is going to win the nobel peace prize for this game <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, yeah uh so my 81 the last one i'm going to talk about it's not about saving the world but it's about the second best thing which is forming the biggest rock and roll band in the world, and it's called Thrash and Roll. Yeah. I don't know. Like, this game, I don't know why I like this game so much, but I really do. <laughs> so, it's a dice placement game. Everybody's taking on the role of some no-name band, and I think they're all actually real bands from Poland, because the designer's from Poland. And you're trying to become as big as the main band in the game called Turbo, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure is also a real band. And you're doing that by placing dice in certain areas on the board. You're going to go to the recording studio to record singles, record albums. You have to go to the music store to get better instruments. Um, you got to go to the record comp, uh, the radio station to promote your album, which is going to help you get higher up on the charts because you're going to get points based on how high up on the chart you are. So it's just a, like, it does a pretty good simulation of like what it's like to be in a band. And I, I enjoy that because I play in a band. And to me, the theme is really interesting, which is part of the reason why it's even on here in the first place. So if you like dice placement and you like thrash metal, rock and roll, heavy metal scene, I say check this one out if you can find it. And that is thrash and roll. I was kind of hoping this game would end up at half price books or like some other closeout place because I want to get a copy. It seems cool enough as it is, but if I get a copy, I'm totally going to paste it up and make the main band called Death Clock, and it's going to be the Metalocalypse <laughs> game. That'd be awesome. You could do that totally. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? So, yeah, it does. The art kind of looks like it, too. It really yeah, does. Really. Like, honestly. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's uh, all the all the 2000s kids who watch the adults when we'll get that joke. Uh, <laughs> my last game to talk about this episode as well, Jason, is a game called Pulsar 2849. And this game is the reason why you paid attention in geometry class, or I guess it would be more algebra, or <laughs> probably even eighth grade math to learn what mode, median, and, uh, mean mean. Because basically when you roll these die, you're going to try and basically put this divider thing on the mode of the die. And then when you draft die, your standard deviation from the midpoint of the die is going to determine like how much that you do in these like tracks and things. Um, so it's kind of cool. It's a dice drafting game, but there's a billion ways to get points in this game. So I think this game was basically, um, I know it says it's by Vladimir Succi, but I don't think that's a real dude. I think that it's actually the Italian design trio plus Stefan Feld made a game together and it was called Pulsar 2849. <laughs> And Dr. Kinizia, because it has standard deviation. <laughs> I forgot. Sorry, Dr. Kinizia. Uh, no, it really, it's an interesting way to draft die and the way how it is, like the amount of difference it is from the, the midpoint of your die is really interesting. And then you're basically zooming around on this spaceship to try and develop different nebula kind of things. Um, it's, I think you'd actually really like this one, Jason. If you could just pretend like, um, the theme is, uh, you're going from clamshell to clamshell in the Mediterranean Sea instead of around stars or something. I think you'd really like it. So um, it's got that dumb space theme that I don't know you don't like, but everything else in this game you would absolutely love. So um, that's Pulsar 2849. Do you have this one? I do. Yeah, this is one that I've been interested in. I watched Man vs. Meeple do a live play of it, I think, somebody. And this does seem super cool. Like, it's got crunch all over it. Absolutely. Like, and it's barely, it barely has a theme. It may yeah. have a board that's in space, but it, there's no theme to this game. Yeah, no, there really isn't. If, <laughs> if you replace the little plastic spaceships with like wooden discs, it would have zero theme. Like, honestly. Yeah, right, right. So that's what I'll do, Jason. I'll get some checkers before we go play. So. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. All right. Well, uh, that's it for this week, guys. Uh, we hope you had fun with us because we were really dumb and had fun, I think. I don't know. I had fun. Sorry, yeah. Jason, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's all good um 
So cool. I've been Joel, and keep gaming. And I'm Jason. Keep gaming. We'll see you next week, guys, when it gets 10% better. Jason, I'm going to go ahead and get started this week. I don't know who started last week, but I'm going to jump in. I'm just so eager. I got to get going on this. My my number 90 game, Jason, we're doing our top 100. If you didn't catch numbers 100 to 91, that was last week. You can find that episode wherever you find podcasts. I think we're on probably any podcast platform. And actually, if you get your podcast from a place where you can't find us at, we would love to know that so we can put your pod, our podcast there. Um, but I think we're on Spotify, we're on Stitcher, we're on Apple, Google, um, and we're on the Zune store. So if you're listening on your Zune, um, good on you. <laughs> Does anybody listen on a Zune? <laughs> I, we're, listen, that's where most of our downloads come from. Most of our downloads come from Canada on Zunes. So, <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I don't uh, think most of our downloads come from Canada, but if you're from Canada and you listen, man, good on you too. Um, because usually Canadians are just so nice. They probably, they probably have to listen to the whole episode as opposed to the average listener who like listens to four and a half minutes and goes, these guys next <laughs> <laughs> this week on this week on the boy who was murdered part one. <laughs> That's what most other podcasts are. I think, I don't know. Yeah. Hey, hey, maybe I should tell people what my number 90 game is now. I don't know. <laughs> I stalled long enough for you to get your list typed in. Let's go. Uh, number 90 for me is millennium blades. Um, I feel like I talked about this game fairly recently, which is weird. Did I talk about it last week? Maybe it's yeah. still 91 and 90. No, I think you talked about it on the g- games you played part, maybe. Did I? I don't know. We can look. Did I put it in my top 100 <laughs> twice? It might be, actually. Oh, no. <laughs> you pulled a me. That's what I'm fixing my list. <laughs> guess what? Uh, I know I swapped two games is what it was. So guess what, Jason? <laughs> um, you want to go first, and then you can edit all this crap out? <laughs> All right.